Good morning, church. Good to see you all this morning. Uh, If you're here in the building, and welcome to those of you joining us online. So good to be with you on this Pentecost Sunday. If we have not met yet, hi, my name is Doug, and I'm one of the pastors here at Venture Missionary Church. And this morning, we're going to continue a series of talks that we started a few weeks ago, as Kelly mentioned, called Not My King. And as Kelly spoke to for the past few weeks, we've been talking about all these different negative emotions that if we're being really honest, all of us over the course of our life have dealt with and struggled with these things that are constantly fighting for control in our lives, right? Things like fear and anger and insecurity and jealousy, all these things that are constantly fighting to control what comes out of our mouth, fighting to control our mood, fighting to control our decisions and our behavior. And so this series is designed to remind us that, hey, We already have a king, and his name is Jesus. And if Jesus is my king, then fear is not my king. Right? If Jesus is my king, well, then anger doesn't get to to dictate what comes out of my mouth. If, If Jesus is my king, then pride and insecurity and greed are not ultimately in control of my life, even if they constantly are trying to control me, because Jesus is ultimately my king. And this morning, we're going to focus on the idea that because Jesus is my king, as Kelly mentioned, then jealousy is not my king. In fact, let me say that again. Jealousy. It's not my king. Jealousy doesn't get to determine what I feel, what I think, what I say, what I do. Jealousy is not my king. In fact, would you say that with me this morning? Just say, jealousy is not my king. That's right. So I want to start this morning's message the exact same way that I started every other message of this series, by reading a passage from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Um, And we're going to read this passage. I I told you this a few weeks ago. We're going to read it every single week uh, of this passage because it's such a beautiful reminder of the supremacy of Christ over everything. In fact, that idea of the supremacy of Christ over everything is a theme that we're going to continue into the summer. We're going to do a series through the book of Colossians and explore the idea that, 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 that Jesus is supreme over everything. But listen to what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Paul writes this. He says, now he, talking about Christ, now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Paul continues, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him the head over all things. Things. Friends, if that's true, then that means that Jesus is my king. And if Jesus is my king, then jealousy is not my king. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to dive into this morning's message. But just before I pray, let me say two things. One of them is going to make me not popular. That's okay. The other one um, uh, is something else. But first of all, I just want to remind you that Ventura Missionary Church will continue to cooperate with the Ventura County Health Department's guidance. And so we ask that you continue to please wear your mask when you are indoors on our campus, even if you have already been vaccinated. Once you're outside, free to remove that mask if you've been vaccinated or if you're going to stay six feet away from people outside of your household. Our plan is to relax those guidelines on June 15th along with the the rest of the county, but we really appreciate your cooperation 
until then. Second thing that I want to say is this. A few years ago, I was at a conference, and I heard a pastor named Robert Madu give a message that resonated with me so much that, that some of today's message is actually inspired and influenced by some of the things that he said. And I just wanted to make sure that I give him full credit for that. So let's pray. Then we're going to dive into this idea that because Jesus is my king, jealousy is not. Let's pray. So, Lord God, we open up ourselves to you. Just a few minutes ago, we sang a song that, that, that yielded and submitted and surrendered. And so, Lord, in this moment, Lord, with all the things that are going on in our minds and in our hearts and our lives, we submit and we surrender and we say, Lord, open up our minds, open up our hearts, open up our eyes and our ears to see and hear and receive everything that your spirit would want to say to us this morning through your word. We ask this and we invite it in the name that's above every other name, the name of King Jesus. Amen. Amen. So when I was 12 years old, I qualified for my very first Junior Olympics swim competition. And I remember traveling with my coach to the beautiful city of industry. If you've ever been to the, the city of industry, it's not very beautiful at all. But they've got this beautiful aquatic complex. And so I get there and I remember walking through the gates of this big, huge aquatic complex. And I was completely overwhelmed. I mean, there I was to, to compete against um, some, of the, some of the fastest age group swimmers in the entire state. Some of these kids that I would be competing against. I didn't know it at the time, but some of them would go on to become collegiate national champions. Some of them would go on to swim in the Olympics. Some of them would actually go on to be gold medalists in the Olympics in the years to come. And I remember getting to the pool the first day of that competition and just being really intimidated as I sort of looked around, right? Uh, even though they were all the same age as I was, like even though I was the same age and I had qualified for this meet just like they had qualified for this meet, I just felt like everyone else sort of deserved to be there. And I was like this imposter that didn't really deserve to be there. I don't know if you've ever gone to an event, a conference for work or some big sporting thing, and you're just kind of really intimidated. You're like, oh my gosh, like everyone else deserved to be here, but I kind of don't feel like I do. That's how I felt in that moment. And so by the time I got to my race, I was absolutely sick to my stomach. I remember coming up to the starting blocks and I just butterflies in my stomach. My palms were sweaty. I was just so nervous. I'm looking at the, the guys on my left and the guys on my right. We jump in because it's a backstroke race. So we jump in the water to get started. And I'm looking at these guys and they're bigger and they're faster and they're stronger. And I'm just so intimidated. So we take our marks, we start the race and, and I come up and, I, and as soon as I started swimming this race, I remember just looking around and everyone else, so concerned about all the other swimmers in the race. Like, are they ahead of me? Am I ahead of them? And so I kept looking around. And since it, since it was backstroke, you can't really see behind you. So I'm swimming this race, and I'm just, my head's on a swivel. I'm just looking everywhere. I'm just looking to my left, looking to my right, trying to spot where everyone is, kind of comparing myself to where they are um, the whole time. So, and I was so busy, this whole race, this whole first lap of the race, looking around at all the other swimmers that I completely missed the flags. Now, if you don't know what the flags are in a backstroke race, if you ever go to like a competition pool, like the Kimball pool um, or even like the YMCA, you'll notice this string of flags stretched across either end of the pool. And those flags are there to help someone swimming backstroke spot how far they are away from the wall. Because when you're swimming backstroke, you can't see the wall. And so in practice, swimmers will actually practice how many strokes it takes from the time they hit the flags until they need to turn and do their flip turn. That way they don't have to look back to spot where the wall is. Well, here I am in this race, so concerned about every other swimmer in this race, looking to my left, looking to my right, looking around, completely missed the flags, and slam my head into the wall. I mean, slam it hard. And, you know, this huge crowd of people, there's all these, you know, athletes there, and I'm the guy that slams my head into the wall. I remember seeing stars for a moment. I just kind of grabbed the, 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 the wall, and everyone's yelling, and there's all this cheering and everything. I realize that I'm still in the middle of a race, and so I push off the wall, uh, and, you know, water goes up my nose. My, my goggles fill with water. I can't see anything, and I finish the race dead last. I mean, just completely dead last, and, and spent the rest of the day with a headache. Who would have thought that you can get a sports concussion from swimming, for goodness sakes, right? But friends, that's the danger of comparison and jealousy. Uh, that's the danger of spending our lives looking around at, at everyone else, comparing the way that we look to the way that they look, comparing what they have to what we have, comparing his car to my car, comparing you know, their big old house to my little rinky-dinky little apartment, right? comparing their family to my family and their life to my life. And if we're not careful, all that looking around, will distract us and cause us to lose sight of the race that God has called us to run. Because comparison kills contentment 
and destroys destiny. Let me say that again. Comparison kills contentment and destroys destiny. See, comparison and jealousy rob us of the life that God has called us to live because we get sucked into chasing his life or her life or trying to be more like him or trying to be more like her instead of passionately pursuing the purposes that God has prepared for us. So let me ask you this question. Who are you racing? Who are you Racing. In other words, who is it in your life, who are the people in your life that you are constantly comparing yourself to? Maybe for you it's, it's a friend. Which one of your friends, think about it right now this moment, which one of your friends do you have a tendency to keep comparing yourself to? Which one of your neighbors do you constantly find yourself in this private, silent, they don't even know that you do it, little comparison game. Who is it that you work with that when they get recognized or they get promoted or they get a raise or someone notices the job that they did, you secretly get irritated? (laughs) Who is it that you go to school with that it seems like they just have everything? Everything's really easy to them. Maybe it's that guy at the gym or that woman that still wears a two-piece. Maybe it's your older brother or sister that you feel like you're constantly in the shadow of. Maybe it's your younger brother or sister that feels like, man, they got all the abilities and gifts and talents, and I didn't, and i got to try to stay one step ahead of them. Maybe it's your brother-in-law or your sister-in-law. Maybe it's the guy with the better car or the woman with the better family or the friend with the better parents. Maybe it's someone you follow on social media. Maybe it's someone that you follow on social media that you've never even met or might not ever meet. And you just wish that your life could be more like the little view of their life that you get through this little screen. Maybe it's not even another person. Maybe you're still racing an expectation that someone else put on you. And you're still trying to measure up to that expectation. See, we all race someone. We all have this tendency to compare ourselves to someone else. We've all felt jealous of someone else for something they have that we wish we had. And when we allow comparison and jealousy to take root in our heart, we get distracted from the race that God has called us to run. Let me show you what I mean. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Some of you are familiar with this passage. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance. What? The race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on who? On Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. See, Scripture is reminding us that we all have a race to run. And in one way, we all collectively have one race. As followers of Jesus, we in in one way have one race that we are called to to, to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love others. To be transformed more and more to the image of Christ. In one way, we all have one race that we are all collectively running. But I also believe that Scripture teaches that each one of us all also have a specific race that only we can run. A unique a unique destiny, a unique purpose that you alone have the distinct set of gifts and abilities and talents and experiences and personality in order to accomplish. And the only way to run that race and to fulfill your destiny is to keep your eyes fixed on who? On Jesus, right? And when we take our eyes off Jesus and we begin to focus on what everybody else is doing or what everybody else has or how everyone else is getting recognized, we will miss the unique race that God has marked out for us. And friends, the Bible is filled with tragic examples of this, right? Just think of of Cain and Abel. (laughs) Think of Jacob and Esau. Think of Rachel and Leah. Think of Joseph and his brothers. Think of Buzz and Woody, right? Okay, that one's not in the Bible, but... But what a great example of how destructive jealousy and comparison can be, right? That's not flying. That's, that's just falling with style, right? What a great example of how jealousy and, and, and comparison can destroy us. But I want to show you perhaps the most dis- uh, uh, tragic example of comparison and jealousy found in the Bible. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. And we're going to look at a man named King Saul. 
And if you're familiar with the Bible, you probably know the story of King Saul. You'll probably remember that right around 3,000 years ago, the people of Israel began to ask God for a king. They looked around at all the other people groups and nations around them, and they said, they've got kings. We want a king to lead us into battle. And so they began to petition and ask God for a king. So God sent Samuel, who was the prophet of the nation of Israel, sort of the spokesman for God, and he sent Samuel to a man named Kish to uh, anoint Kish's son, Saul, as the first king over Israel. And if you fast forward through some of Saul's story a few years, you get to the point where King Saul and the Israelite army found themselves up against the Philistine army led by a giant named Goliath, right? And you probably know the story, a young shepherd boy named David shows up to bring supplies to his older brothers uh, on the battlefront and ends up stepping up with a sling and five smooth stones and kills Goliath by hitting him in the head with a stone and then running up to him, pulling out Goliath's own sword and, sorry kids, cutting off the head of Goliath. And in that moment, man, David became famous Like David went from being a nobody to becoming a celebrity overnight. He went from being a shepherd boy to being a rock star. Literally a rock star. (laughs) And in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 5, we read this. That whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. And this pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. So David is getting promoted really, really quickly. And we see that when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from the town of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and timbrels and lyres. And they danced, and as they danced, they sang. Listen to this song. They sang, Saul has slain his thousands. Saul's chest puffs out. Yeah, I have. But David, his tens of thousands. Hold up. What? Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. He said, they have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Did you catch that? Did did you catch the way that that, that comparison and jealousy began to creep into Saul's heart? Oh, they've credited David with tens of thousands, but me with only thousands. David up here and me down here. And the moment that Saul began to compare his success with David, the moment that he began to compare his popularity with David's popularity, he went from running his race like this to fixing a jealous eye on David. And scripture says that from that time on, Saul kept an eye, a close eye on David. I love what Robert Madu says. He says this. He says, therefore, Saul becomes a case study on the downward spiral of what comparison will always do to your life. Because comparison and jealousy are always the beginning of the end. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that technically the comparison didn't start with Saul. Saul wasn't the one that started the comparison. Did you notice that the comparison actually started when the crowd, the crowd of women began to compare David's achievements with Saul? And listen to me, when your eyes are not on Jesus, the voice of the crowd becomes a powerful force, doesn't it? When our eyes are not fixed on Jesus, the opinion of others, how many likes, how many followers, what other people think, what other people are saying, the reputation, the thing that people are saying, the things that people say about you becomes a really powerful force when our eyes are not fixed on Jesus. And that's exactly what happens to Saul. Saul goes from running his race to listening to the voice of the crowd and getting pulled off course and beginning to keep his eyes, a jealous eye fixed on David. See, the voice of other people's comparison, the voice of other people's expectations can begin to deposit seeds of resentment and comparison and jealousy in our hearts. And when Saul hears the words of the crowd, he thinks to himself, they have credited David with tens of thousands, but me with only thousands. And that's how comparison always starts. Comparison and jealousy always starts with but me. Well, them, but me. Well, they have, but all I have. 
Comparison and jealousy always start with this idea of but me. Every single one of us. Listen, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman or a, a, a boy or a girl, a child or an adult. It doesn't matter. Every single one of us has looked at someone who is bigger, stronger, faster, smarter, skinnier, more talented, healthier, richer, has more hair, whatever, and has caused us to feel that but me attitude. What about me? Why don't I have what he has? Why don't I look the way that she looks? Why can't my parents be more like their parents? Why can't my kids be more like her kids? Why can't I drive a car like that? Why can't I have as many followers as, as she does? Why can't my husband be more like him? Why can't my wife be more like her, right? Why did God give them so much and me so little? And if we're not careful... We can go through our entire life looking at everyone through a pair of butt me glasses. <laughs> you ever put on the butt me glasses? You don't have to raise your hand because I can't see you anyway. <laughs> but we've all put on the butt me glasses and butt me glasses blind us to anything and everything. I can't see you right now. I can't even... I don't know where the edge of the stage, okay, this is my safe spot. Okay, I'm going to stay right here. But, but these but me glasses and this but me attitude blinds me to the purposes for which God has called me. Because all I'm looking at is me. Well, they've got and but me. And how come she has? And what about me? And he's got. And what about me? And we spend our lives off course because we got on a pair of these but me glasses. And nothing will blind you to running the race that God has marked out for you like a pair of butt-me glasses and a butt-me attitude. Because my eyes were never supposed to be focused on me, right? And my eyes and my attention and my focus was never supposed to be on you. My eyes are supposed to be fixed on Jesus, who scripture says is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And when we fall into the trap of comparison and jealousy, we will become distracted from the purposes for which God has called us, which is exactly what happens to Saul. It's exactly what happens to Saul. Saul's story starts with such promise. And if you know the rest of his story, it ends with such tragedy. Because comparison kills contentment and destroys destiny. It's exactly what's going to happen to you and me if we don't recognize when we're putting on the butt me glasses. Whenever we start allowing comparison and jealousy to distract us and blind us. So what are some signs? Like as we sit here, as you're participating online, you go, okay, yeah, okay, I get it, yeah. What, what, are, what are some signs? How do I know when I've put on those but me glasses? How do I know when I'm walking around distracted because I'm so focused on comparing and, and jealousy? Let me give you five warning signs really quick that, 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 that you and I might be wearing our but me glasses. If you listen to any of these five and you go, hmm. Okay, maybe that one, that one might be a warning sign that you and I might have on our butt me glasses. The first one is this. If you or I have a hard time celebrating the successes of other people. They get recognized and there's something inside you that's like, well, why didn't they recognize me? I mean, I'm happy for you, yay, but like, what about me? Someone else gets promoted, someone else gets a raise, someone else gets the good grade, someone else gets selected for the team, someone else gets made captain, someone else gets made, made team lead, someone else gets whatever the thing is, gets the attention, gets asked to the dance, whatever the thing is, someone else gets it and you don't, and you have a hard time celebrating the successes of other people. No one knows about it. You know, if the camera panned to you, you'd be smiling and clapping, but secretly on the inside, there's something going on that just won't fully allow you to, to celebrate the success of other people. You might be wearing the butt me glasses. Number two, if you complain a lot, you might be wearing the butt me glasses. No elbows here, nobody elbowing the person next to you. That's you. Oh my gosh, that's totally you. No, 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 that's not what we're doing. If you complain a lot, you might be wearing the butt me glasses. Now, listen, complaining isn't always a bad thing. In fact, Scripture teaches us that there is a right way to complain, which is actually the topic of the next series that we're going to be doing after we're done with this one, a series we're calling Good Grief, where we're going to talk about the, 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 the how to complain the right way. We'll be starting that next month. But complaining can also be a sign that we've got on our butt me glasses. Number three, the third warning. In your prayer life, if you ask God more than you thank God, you might be wearing the butt me glasses. 
Now listen, am I saying that you can't ask God? No, of course. Jesus commands us or instructs us when we pray to petition God, to ask God for things. There's nothing wrong with asking. But if you find that in your prayer life it is all asking and demanding and complaining and why can't and I need you and you need to do this and why haven't you and why aren't you, and it's all asking and very little thanking, you, you might, not saying for sure, but you might have on the buttony glasses. Number four, if you are stingy, with your compliments, you might be wearing but me glasses. If you are stingy, well, that's just the family that I was raised in. You know, we didn't say much. We didn't give compliments. We're just not wordy people. We just, that's just not how. Okay, that, that may be all true. But I'm going to ask you, when was the last time that you gave a sincere, genuine, heartfelt compliment to someone? All right. Conviction moment is over. Okay, moving on. Number five, if there is anyone in your life that secretly you would find joy in their failure, that's the person you're racing. Their car gets scratched. Their lawn dies. <laughs> their kid gets in trouble. Finally, their kid finally does something wrong. And you celebrate their failure. That's the person you're racing. You're wearing the buttony glasses. Now, I want you to just look at that list for just a minute. Let the Spirit of God point out maybe some opportunities for growth here. So what do we do? How, 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 do, we, how do we pull off and take off these buttony glasses? How do we stop falling into the trap of comparison and jealousy that Saul fell victim to? Do we just stop complaining? Well, just stop complaining. Just stop feeling jealous. Just stop comparing ourselves to other people. I wish it were that easy. I would love to say yes, but I don't think it's that easy. I actually think the solution starts with something else. In fact, I think the best way to take off our butt me glasses and get rid of jealousy and comparison is, hear me now, to celebrate. Now, let me explain what I mean, because that might sound weird, and you're like, I don't know what, I don't get it. When I celebrate my daughter's birthday, who is the focus on? My daughter, right? When I celebrate my parents' uh, wedding anniversary in three weeks, who is our attention and focus on? My parents, right? When I celebrate my friend's promotion at work, who, who, who is the focus on? My friend. See, when I celebrate someone else, it helps me get my eyes off of me. And so I want to encourage you to do two things this week. Just as a way to sort of put this into practice. We hear a sermon and we go, okay, that's fine. But what, what, do I, what do I do? How do I, how do, I do something with that or about that? So I want to encourage you to do two things this week. Just to put into practice a way to, to get rid of jealousy and comparison. Two things. Celebrate God privately and celebrate others publicly. Celebrate God privately. I'm going to break these down for just a second. We'll wrap it up. Celebrate God privately and celebrate others publicly. So number one, celebrate God privately. In other words, when you spend time with God this week, and, and what I mean by that is I don't just mean, you know, a lot of us will go, I spend God, you know, all throughout the day. I, I understand that. But is there a point in your day where you sort of like shut out all of the other distractions for at least some period of time and, and just Spend some time with God and, and concentrate on him and focus on him and thank him and worship him and, and, and pray. Is there some, So when you do that, I'm assuming that you do, when you do that, celebrate God. Begin to thank him for who he is. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16, 17, and 18 says this. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always. And so privately, in my own time with God, I'm celebrating him. God, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to, to live a life that I could never live, to die a death that I deserve to die, to pay the penalty for my sin so that I could be invited into right relationship with you, God. It's thanking God. It's celebrating him. And as I do that, my, my inward focus my, my but me tendency begins to fade. So we, we celebrate God privately. And then the second thing that I want to invite you to do is to celebrate others publicly. 
In other words, this week, look for genuine, don't make them up, genuine opportunities. In other words, if someone actually does do something good, if their lawn does look good, if you do like their car, if, you, you know, if their kids are honor roll students, whatever the thing is, if they graduate from high school or middle school or kindergarten or whatever, if you see something that is worth complimenting, then give a genuine compliment. Celebrate others publicly. Be intentional about this week. Look for opportunities to compliment and encourage. If you live with someone, if you're in a family or you have someone in your home, look for opportunities to compliment. And you're like, yeah, I wish there were some. There are some. Look for them. Be intentional about finding ways to encourage and celebrate the achievements and the accomplishments and the blessings and the good things that are happening in someone else's life. Do that consistently. Romans 12, 15 reminds us, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Friends, may you and I, Get rid of our but me glasses, our jealousy and our comparison. And may we trade those things in for a habit of, of celebration. As we learn to celebrate God's goodness and rejoice with the successes and the accomplishments of other people. Because Jesus is our king. And if Jesus is my king, then, then comparison and resentment and bitterness and jealousy and but me are not my king. Amen? Amen. Would you stand to your feet if you are able, if you're here with us? Would you stand to your feet? And as you stand to your feet, would you say that, that jealousy is not my king? Would you say that together? One, two, three. Jealousy is not my king. Uh, friends, let's just go ahead and, and pray. God, I ask that you would free us from the sickness of jealousy and resentment and bitterness. That you would free us from these, these, this but me attitude that, that plagues us. This, these but me glasses that we've been wearing our, our whole lives. Would you set us free from that, Lord? Give us the ability to keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus, and to run the race with perseverance that you've marked out for us throwing off everything that hinders and the sin that, that creeps in and, and entangles us up. Help us celebrate you this week as we celebrate those around us, Lord. And help us love you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And to love those around us as we encourage, as we rejoice with the accomplishments and the achievements of the people around us. Lord, we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.